All right. Uh, so we're here for SOLIDWORKS. Whoa, we're getting ahead. Um, who has used SOLIDWORKS like a basic level? Versus, okay. Who's not used SOLIDWORKS at all? Okay. Well, good. That's a low ratio. So I'm not covering the basic stuff at all. One, because I'm kind of lazy. And two, because there's a lot of good information out there to get the basics started. I should probably start with, I'm Adam Hurd, mentor on 973, use SOLIDWORKS a bunch. Really love it. Um, I got about a half hour material, maybe less, and I'm going to open it up to questions for you guys, and we'll cover the rest in there. So hopefully with this many people, we have questions, or uh, we're going to run out of material. I didn't quite finish all the slides. So uh, first thing I want to point you to, these are probably the best resources available for FRC to get started. Uh, I don't know if I'm the best, but these two are really solid. I haven't actually used this one, but some smart people have told me that the Solid Professor program for FRC is a pretty good intro. I know you can only do one account per team, so when you sign up, like, don't do it with like your personal account and then be afraid to share your password with everyone else, that sort of thing. Um, and then Aaron K, I can't say his last name on, uh, Aaron Hill might know his last name. Aaron K on 1114 did like a 40 part video series uh, that's posted here. And what I like about it is he starts with like tools, but then he ends with a project. So it's not like, because I think the Solid Professor stuff and a lot of other tutorials are like, here's how you make a block with a hole in it. And then there's still kind of a jump to like what design is. His, you know, goes all the way through. My videos are decent. Like if you already know a bunch of SolidWorks stuff, they're like tips and tricks, but they're not a good place to start. Uh, yeah, they, I got a really strange sample presentation. So I left some of that in there as a slight protest. So I, I don't even know what this is. Does anyone know what this is? There we go. All right, so uh, super, super simplified. I guess this is specific CAD goals, not SOLIDWORKS goals. Uh, in my opinion, at least, you just want a better robot faster, and it doesn't have to be as rigid or nice as industry CAD practices. Uh, a lot of teams, since they have a bunch of kids working on it, will do all the proper industry stuff, and they'll have really beautiful models and do renders and all that, and that's awesome if that's what you guys want to do, but that part isn't necessary for the competitive reasons. If you want to do that for educational or marketing reasons, that's great, but some of the rigidity there, uh, if you learned that way, will slow you down a little bit if you just want to cat faster. So kind of a devil's advocate point of view there. Today's topic, I'm going to do just three things, and then we're going to open up to topics. Uh, 2D sketches, I do almost all of my work on 2D sketches now because I mostly do conceptual stuff. Uh, part of that's you know, in my head a little bit and then I pass that off to kids and other people and they do all the 3D stuff. I'm going to talk a little bit about symmetric and reflexive parts. Uh, there's a couple things you can do real simply and easily as you're drawing to just have less dimensions in there and then also make it easier to change when you go forward. I'm always surprised when I open up CAD from certain people I really respect and it's like, oh my god, you're not doing anything right at all. This is horrible if you want to change it even a little bit. And then this last one is like, I'm not sure I want to be the person publicly saying that this is something you should do. But if you use this last thing right, multi-body parts, it is a huge, huge time savings. Um, but there's some risk of, of, of nastiness there. So let's get started. That's my contact. I'm done with the slides at this point if you guys are satisfied. So if you want to contact me or the team, that's what we'd like you to hit at. All right, so 2D sketches. So um, one thing I really like doing, and I, you know, I have most of the kids start with this, is if you're going to explore, like, does a single joint arm work, or you know, how high could the elevator go, you see a lot of people start like, with 3D models. And they draw a bunch of stuff and then go like, oh, that's, that's too long. That's not going to fit, or that sort of thing. So you want to get as much done in the 2D space as possible, because it's just so much faster to work here. So like. Let's say we're looking at, I don't know, just a generic single joint arm. And you know, we're kind of doing old school sizing rules. So I'm going to start drawing a box that is like the size box. Um, I turned my keyboard shortcuts off, so I'm going to be struggling a little in front of you guys. I go too fast otherwise. So really simplified, that's an arm mass there, like really hand waving. You know, there's no structure involved or whatever. You know, maybe we've got a big sprocket on this, so I'm going to put them four inches inside the corner. So do you guys believe me that that's a whole robot arm mast? A lot of enthusiastic responses. Amazing. Um, so now, like you can really quickly, I know this seems like way too simple. I'm like, why is he going over this? But it's surprising the number of people that do not start at this level and spend, you know, a half hour to get to the point of like, well, 
can this reach, I don't know, what's a good number, Aaron? 96. 96 inches. So, I mean, what do you guys think? How would you interpret this? You know, we're, we're kind of hitting 96 now, but what are some of the trade-offs involved with what we just discovered? I'm going to need some interaction, or I'm going to really fail at this presentation. What was that? Doesn't extend past the frame. Is, is that an issue? You know, we, we don't necessarily know at this point. Some games that would be, some games that wouldn't be. So, you know, boom, we just did like a minute and answered a pretty high level question. Um, another thing you can do here is, you know, instead of doing this arm length, you can go like, rather than, uh, you know, dictate that dimension, go, I just want to see what's the longest thing based on the constraints I have. So, like, based on whatever's going on in the end here, I, I need it two inches in the size box, and based on my bumpers or whatever, you know, maybe you come in and draw your bumpers, I can do 10 inches here, and you can start moving this point around for, for whatever reason and seeing, like, oh, this is the length that my arm results in, and these are the heights it can go to, and that sort of thing. Um, I really, I mean, this is a really simplified example, so it's not showing that too well. I try to, when I'm doing geometry like this, make the least amount of decisions possible. Because you don't really care that your arm or elevator or whatever is 37 inches long. You care about these functional dimensions. Like, it needs to come back into the size box at this point. It needs to reach this high, that sort of thing. So, let's do another one of those. Oh, actually, I'm going to open something that shows the really extreme of that. I did start my recording, and if I didn't, it's too late now, so. So, fairly complicated looking assembly. Oh, I'm driving all horribly. I, I'm useless without my shortcuts. Open up the first sketch, and if you look in here, the first sketch actually has a whole lot going on. Is this, like, visible for you guys? Oh, that's great. Okay, cool. You can see, you know, bearing placement. If you start looking at more, actually, you come over here, and I've kind of made the front view and a side view, which you can kind of argue is bad practice, but I really love doing this stuff for FRC. And those are linked with geometric relations. Um, for whatever reason, equations, like each new student version with the kids and all that stuff, a lot of our equations break, so we pretty much completely avoid equations, which is a bummer. Um, but yeah, so you come over here, you have the separate view, you can see, you know, if the tubes are this long, um, you know, these are the heights you can get and all that. So, you know, we pretty much did the whole design for this elevator in this sketch, like 99% of it. Whereas doing that in 3D would be like literally five or ten times the work. So, I mean, we then made it 3D and threshed it out, but uh, almost all of these parts you see when you zoom in are linked back to that 2D sketch. So, like 99% of the changes are in that first sketch. So, it's really, really quick to change, and all the two blanks are automatically reflexive and that sort of thing. Uh, whereas, I mean, if anyone's used to doing it manually, it's like, let's change the elevator an inch. That's a lot of work, right? Another thing I really like doing um, that's really, really powerful in 2D is uh, pneumatic deployment stuff. So a lot of people seem to pick their pneumatic cylinder placement based on, like, oh, it fits here, and then let's see what happens. Um, we almost exclusively go, so this is going to be kind of extract so you don't have the robot. I got some 8-inch arm. Let's make it longer. Let's make it like 30 inch. This is like a 2014 intake. We got a 30-inch arm, and we want it to move 45 degrees, or uh, 53 degrees is good. But it also could be like we want it to come out to this height. I don't know. 24 inches. So to be clear, what you're looking at is this, this is just representing something. So if I had more time, you'd draw a frame, you'd draw a stick, you'd see the wheel, you'd have all that kind of stuff. Um, but the key takeaway here is you have something, and then you want to show where it is somewhere else to do a motion, which is you know, typically what you're doing with intakes and that sort of thing. Um, so then what I like to come in and do is I will make equally constrained, and there's a rant video on this one specifically if you want to review this when we're done. Um, just like everything else, you don't really care where that cylinder attaches. Like, you don't care that that cylinder attaches at 7 inches or whatever. You care that you get good deployment geometry. So, you want to give it the least amount of constraints possible, um, which is also a good search tool. You, you'll, you'll start go like, oh, I want to use this size cylinder, drop it in there, and quickly SolidWorks won't let you place it. And you're like, okay, that's not going to work at all. So, you save the time of going to 3D completely by doing that whole exploration in 2D space. Um, another real key takeaway here, who has spec cylinders like from the Bimba catalog where you get like the base length, the stroke, the clevis length? So 
a really useful tool as you guys start doing nomadic design, and nomadics are awesome, you should do more, is look at the Bimba catalog, and they give you functions to determine the length of a cylinder. And for FRC, the cylinder essentially is three numbers. There's the base length. That is the length from the tail hole, if it's the rear pivot style, to the front of the thread with no stroke. So if the cylinder had zero inches of stroke, that's how long it'd be. There's the stroke length. That's how long the cylinder actuates. And then there's whatever length your clevis adds. So I like coming in, and I draw the same cylinder twice. And I'll go over what these three things are in a moment. So you can see I drew one set of lines with three and one with four. This rear length here, we're going to make the base length of the cylinder. I forget what size cylinder this is, but 3.84 sounds really familiar. This line here, and then the double line there, that's the stroke length. Because the stroke length is built into the collapse length of the cylinder, so maybe we'll do two inch. Actually, that's really short for that year. Maybe we'll start with like six. Um, and then this bottom line would be the extended cylinder. That's why you have the stroke length again. And then clevis, I don't know, I think inch and eighth sounds right. So now you have a mock cylinder that you can come in, and if you've been designing off like McMaster, and you look up, oh, the cylinder length is this, and then I went over here and I found the clevis length, and I typed it together and added it. Now let me change my cylinder length. We do that process all over again and waste a bunch of time. Now you can just go, well, I want a 7-inch cylinder or an 8-inch cylinder, and this total length stays valid, which saves a huge amount of, oh, got to stay collinear here, though. Oh, actually, that really got screwed up. I'm going to start this part over. I'm sorry, guys. A lot of pressure. Usually no one's watching me when I'm doing all this. All right, so base length, 3.84. Does anyone know what size cylinder that is by any chance? Is that 3 quarter or is that inch and 16? I'd be really impressed if you guys know. It's okay if you don't. Yeah, yeah, I, I would not doubt you if you guessed. All right, I think I got it working this time. All right, so now this is the tricky part. SolidWorks doesn't handle motion well. Sometimes getting these initial lineups can be uh, quite stressful without breaking it. Ooh. Merge point. Okay. So you'll notice I've actually made no dimensional decisions right now in terms of the actual like cylinder geometry and mounting. We we showed how long our intake is and we showed like where we want the result in motion to be, but we haven't actually made any decisions. Um, which is nice because it lets you go with this three inch cylinder, you know, everywhere that it lets me place this hole is a valid valid mounting option. It's not necessarily a valid motion option, but it's valid to mount there. So Let's say you know this, this origin is like on our frame rail or something, so we know it'd be convenient to make this like an inch or something, because that's like a nice bracket size. So then you can start narrowing in and going like, well, maybe you know, I'll, I'll dictate it this way. And as I change this dimension, you can see that your lever arms change. So what's really cool about this as well is you can come in, and if you guys know what torque is, you can pick up the perpendicular distance here and kind of move your cylinder placement around by controlling this torque. So, Looking at this intake, if you're really trying to be optimal with air use, which position would you want to be generating more torque in? Any other answers, maybe? It's the other one. So why, why do you need more torque here than here? What's the gravity load of the intake here when it's straight vertical? I heard mumblings. I didn't hear an answer, though. Anybody? It's zero, right? If, if you think straight up on a pivot, there's no torque required. Uh, and as you go down, you start needing more torque. And you can feel that with your own arm, you know, picking up something heavy through that. So if you can play around and optimize the cylinder placement, you could go, well, I want the lever arm of this cylinder here to be bigger. So you could start moving this around and go, oh, okay, this is starting to be a more optimal alignment. Um, what's also cool about this is since you've, you've done this science, you know, and you can get off air pressure and the bore size, you can get that force, you can calculate the torque, you can come out here to the tip, you can make really good comparisons about what forces are involved. So like 2015, um, 
I went to Vexco Worlds, and it was great. My kids did everything. Um, they made a whole new intake for champs where it, it opened to a different amount, and it closed to a different amount, so it was different positions. Um, and they knew from testing on the comp bot with the existing intake that when it was set to like 43 PSI or whatever, that was the optimal force on the cylinder to get, you know, the fact we could still pick up totes, we could write cans, we could do all that stuff. So they went in, okay, well, with the existing cylinder geometry, we had 43 PSI and came in and CAD says it's this lever arm, we come out to the tip and that's this force. And then they marched that backwards to make sure they had the same force when they went to a totally different amount of articulation. And if you had to do that whole process by guessing and checking like, oh, I think the cylinder should mount here and the nose should go here, it'd be like impossible. Whereas I think, you know, it probably took Jack Fisher, the, the, the captain that year, maybe an hour from measuring on the robot, figuring out what the resultant forces were on the current robot, figuring out the new motion needs to go from this range to this range and use those forces, and then now we're already cutting parts on the router. So that was super awesome. So any other stuff you guys want to see in 2D or are you guys ready to move on to general reflexivity and that sort of stuff. I'm going to do questions at the end for like last hour, half hour anyway, so if it's on this topic, we could just sneak it in now. Yes, sir? So, 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 so you just done a wonderful discussion of, of, sort of particular cylinder placement and mm -hmm. choices. But oftentimes, all that analysis is kind of pointless because there's just, here's the thing that you should always do. Is there anything along about all this that where, okay, this is all fun, but here's the thing you should always do that would apply to this. Um, so, you know, going as far as looking at the lever arms and stuff, I, I think is nice. It, it's so cheap if you understand what it is that I wouldn't ignore that information when it's in front of you. Certainly the key takeaway here when you're doing pneumatics is, I think, unless there's like a gun to your head and you have to do it right now, the worst way to do pneumatics is go, I'm going to get this cylinder and I'm going to try mounting it here and here and let's see what happens. Um, and after you do this a bunch, you start being able to eyeball it really well, and it's like, that team's intake super unoptimal, that team intake super unoptimal, so on and so on, you start seeing really bad design. Um, I think it's worth when you're placing the Maddox to at least do the first half of this, where you draw up this cylinder, and you kind of explore, like, can I even, wow, oh, they've changed the click and delete, it bugs me. Um, you know, if you can't place this point somewhere, then it's an invalid combo. Or the other key takeaway, I mean, you have to go crazy with this intake to do it. If the, the two cylinder vectors cross the origin, that means your thing over-centered. That means your intake will deploy once and then never come back up. So that's another bad one to catch. Um, I guess I'm kind of missing your question. I'm sorry. Let me think about it. I'll ask it later. All right. Any other 2D stuff you guys want to see? Like, I could do, like, an elevator or, like, a shooter thing real quick or... So when it came to the elevator, you had a, your base sketch. Uh-huh. Uh, we're going to come back to that one, actually, to, okay. to probably answer your question. That's the last one we're going over today. Uh, I guess I'll do a shooter or something real quick anyway, just to show some more 2D stuff. I'm kind of bad at this part, guys. Since I've been doing SolidWorks like 10 years, I forget like what the very first part is like and if it's easy to learn or not. So, you know, so you got a 4-inch flywheel. Want to draw a hood or whatever. You know, I like coming here and specifying compression instead of, uh, like, the radius of that other flywheel. I'm drawing this horizontal line there just to give me something to measure to. I don't know, we want 55 degrees or whatever. That's what worked on the prototype. Um, you know, we're going to want a two-inch roller. As you start getting more detailed, you can then, like, start drawing tubes and stuff in this. So, like, oh, we know we're going to want an inch and eighth bearing for this. You know, on the prototype, the kids are like, oh, this worked really well, and this is an inch and a quarter down, and we wanted this, I don't know, 11 inches back, and you can come in and, like, start drawing. I mean, for us, we use almost the same tube everywhere, um, and we pre-drill it at the beginning of the season, and it's super helpful. You can drop that tube in there, start adding holes, and you can really design the whole thing in, in one shot and then take it 3D. I don't know. I love this. I do this for almost everything now. Let's move on to reflexive stuff. So... This is almost more based than what we just did, but it's super valuable. How many people use SolidWorks in here and don't be embarrassed and don't really even know the importance of the front, top, and right plane? Like, who's like, I'm not really sure why these are in here? There should be more hands up. I, I, I'm proud of you for having the courage to raise your hand. Um, 
These three planes are super useful. And then what I come and do for our templates as well is uh, the part template has these three axes added in that just are a function of these planes. Um, anytime you are catting or making a part that has physical symmetry, you know, it is a rectangle, it's round or whatever, that symmetry should line up on these planes because then you get a bunch of stuff for free as you're doing stuff. So like one part I really love for this is we used to do bearing blocks that were rectangles of a certain sort. So I forget these numbers. I think it was like 1 and 5 sixteenths. This is maybe 1 and 7 eighths. So I used the center point rectangle here up here because I wanted a rectangle that was lined up on there. What you see a lot of people do, just ignore the first rectangle. They'll draw a rectangle like that, and then now you're not lined up on your planes of symmetry. And you'll see in a couple moments why that can be really valuable. So now I'm going to extrude this, and these are like 0.99, and I'm not going to do blind. I'm going to do mid-plane so that, once again, the center of that part is on the plane of symmetry. And even if you're making a part where you feel like it's not going to be symmetric at the end, everything up until that point, like if it's still a rectangle or that sort of thing, you might as well put on the plane of symmetry just for the habit of it. Oh, I missed a part. We want a big hole in the middle. I'm like completely lost without my keyboard shortcuts. This is really embarrassing. So we got that hole there. Um, I'm going to do something kind of silly here just for futureness. We're going to put a point one chamfer there and we're just going to click that one corner. Put a hole on this face. I'm also going to do something kind of silly here when I do this hole. A oh, center point rectangle doesn't work here. I did that line because I don't want to dimension that hole to the origin. I kind of want to dimension this bolt pattern. Why is this not working? Um, and that lets you achieve that, if that makes sense. So you put that hole there, not the hole I wanted. All right, so we got that tapped hole there. Um, so, I mean, these are kind of silly to do some of these things with uh, what I'm about to do, but it's really powerful for more advanced stuff. So you can come in and pick up this mirror tool and go on the right plane and mirror that. Oh, does it have to be geometry pattern? I honestly do not know the explanation of why this has to be checked sometimes and not others, but anytime I have a mirror or pattern not work, I just do the other thing, and it works like 90% of the time, and then the last 10% you just have to do something else. So now you can come in and uh, mirror again on your top plane. Oh, and then now you can grab everything again and you can mirror again on your front plane. Well, I really missed that three times in a row. So I know it seems a little silly, like why didn't I draw all those holes at the whole wizard point? But you know, if you're sitting down really trucking going fast, like y you one saved a little bit of time doing that, especially if there's a lot of different features, if you have the chamfer, if you have different holes and all that. But what's cool now is you can change just in one spot this chamfer size and they all change. I mean that was true anyway. You can come into this bolt circle and you can change where that is. Oh, I didn't type a different number. So that's super valuable there. Does it make sense, guys? Does that seem useful and important? Yeah. Cool. Um, kind of in a similar tone to. One thing you might want to mention. Yes. So he was using the whole wizard to, to do that, those corner features. Don't, you don't want to edit any of those numbers manually. You don't always do stuff. Then it's going to break. That was a great point. He's talking about the dimensions that show up for the hole, you don't want to mess with. The dimensions that place the holes, those are good to, to mess with, to be clear. This is probably awful on the microphone. <laughs> Another cool thing for symmetry and stuff is uh, you know, a lot of teams draw multi-body shafts. That's kind of not as big as it used to be in FRC, and it often ends up as like seven features and gets really cumbersome. So what I like to do, also I like infinite length line. I just feel better if that's infinite length. So let's say we're going to draw a hex shaft with uh, snap ring grooves and multiple bearing rounds and stuff. I'm doing this fast and I'm going to talk about what I'm doing. I like to put it all in one sketch. Like, if there's only one takeaway today, guys, it's like, I, if it were up to me, the robot would be one sketch. Like, cause then everything changes really easy. So what we're looking at here is a half-inch hex shaft that we're going to bearing round. That's going to be round. That's going to be round. That's going to be hex. 
snap ring groove, just the end of the shaft. So there's certain parts you know are going to be collinear, so you're going to come in and do that. Oh, clicked poorly. Certain parts you know are going to be equal. And if you guys see me do any stuff that seems kind of like noobish, let me know. I'm always curious to hear other people's tips and tricks for SOLIDWORKS and that sort of thing. What was that? Uh, no, I was wondering. I, this is, I, I was asking because I was taking notes. And mm -hmm. You mentioned round and hex things. Is there anything else that you were going to have there besides the round? Uh, no, this is just rounds and hex. Uh, so this at the end here is a half-inch snap ring. Um, if you don't have them memorized, Make Master is actually like the greatest place to look up snap ring grooves for me. So that we did the snap ring groove there. You can see the other side is good at this point. We're going to come in and we're going to make this half-inch round. Uh, let's say we want like ah, 60. 60 thou past the snap ring, so we get that. You know, this is going to be on a bearing that's 5 16 thick, so maybe we want to do like 320 thou to do a little clearance. Um, and, you know, sometimes you want to dimension this number between the snap ring space and the assembly. Sometimes you want between the bearings. There's lots of different options depending on what you're trying to design, but let's maybe make this two and a half inches. Um, and there's a reason I made this one up here, like comically oversized, and you'll see that in a moment. Dimensions on the side to be from as if it were a full round thing. Oh, so, so, yeah, so I started with guys, hopefully you already know all the basics of SOLIDWORKS because I, I don't have great attention to detail with this kind of stuff. Um, if you are dimensioning to a center line and you pull across center line, SOLIDWORKS assumes that's a diameter because it assumes you're going to want to roll that around for a revolve. So I'm going to revolve this part, and then what I'm going to do to make this visually good, I'm going to come in here. I'm going to use the hex tool. And what's cool, you'll notice about what I'm drawing now, the entire feature, both the sketch and the extrusion, have no numbers. They are entirely dependent on that first sketch. So you can come in back to the first sketch now. And I did that, I made that number big, just to make it easier to click on that edge. So what I'm about to do is like technically sort of wrong. I'm just going to make that hex a thou bigger than the round to make it work, but like you guys don't even know what size your hexes are, probably, if you're buying hexes off the shelf. So it's totally valid to do that, in my opinion. Because you're not dimensioning that hex as like an inspected drawing on the drawing anyway. And if you are, it's going to be a bigger number than the round anyway. So yeah, there you go. Now you have a multi-body FRC hex shaft that is entirely controlled by one sketch. So who, raise your hand. Who's done this before, where you did this as a body, this as a body, this as a body, this as a body, and so on and so on all the way down? I, I used to do that. And then you're like, oh, okay, come in, and you're at the assembly, and you measure, and you're like, okay, I need it to be 3.957 between the snap ring grooves, and you change this body, and you're like, oh, that's not actually the one I wanted to change, and you play that game, and you're like a couple minutes into it now, and you could have just come here. And you can also, what's nice about this, you can delete this two and a half and go, oh, I was wrong. You know, I actually wanted to mention this number, and I want it 1.75, and boom, it saves so much time. Say that again? Double click on a face in a solid view. Oh, yeah. And then, and then double click the dimension you want to. I, don't go, I never go back and open Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to delete that dimension. But yeah, he's right. If you just want to edit dimensions, guys, you can just click and do that. Do you guys use that? I use that a lot. Super helpful. Just double click on a face and get the right number to change. All right. So. That was kind of the, the real cheat sheet of the tips and tricks. Um, really, the theme of what I'm trying to convey to you guys there is, you know, on the earlier 2D stuff, do as much as you can 2D with a little bit of your imagination to explore stuff. You can't stop there, though. It's unfair unless you have a really good communication with the next person, which, you know, I, I have a, a young mentor. He was a 2015 captain. who Him and I communicate really well, so I can get away with it him. I can do a 2D sketch, talk to him, and hand it to him. But for anyone else, you can't just stop at a 2D sketch. You can explore and get good ideas, but to convey it to people making the robot or if someone else is finishing the design or whatever, you then have to make it 3D like you guys are used to doing in the appropriate ways. Um, and then on the other end of that, you know, use as much as you can in terms of reflexiveness. Minimize the amount of features you add that you don't need to be adding. If you are adding features, try to make them based on previous features like that hex so that it comes to one sketch, especially if you're sharing. You know, a lot of teams have different dynamics and like no one will ever share parts. Um, it's nice, you know, it's the, it's the ideal because you might come back to something years in the future and you don't really remember what you did. Um, that if someone can 
open that first sketch and go, boom, like, oh, I understand this part. I mean, how many times you guys open something up and you're like, I don't know how to change this. Like, you are really honest. I appreciate this guy in the back. Um, it's like, I, I, I can't edit this. So what you do is you start like hacking on features at the end, doing dumb stuff, just because the part initially was poorly drawn. It wastes your time, wastes their time, yada, yada. Then I also do this to myself. Like, I open old stuff, and I'm like, what a jerk. I can't believe I drew it this way. I'm wasting my time. All right, so last thing. This is, uh, this is kind of a dirty secret almost. So we, we've been doing this for a couple seasons and just didn't tell anyone because I was afraid it would like get totally bastardized and out of hand. But now SOLIDWORKS has a tool that changes this from like kind of hokey process to incredibly valuable thing. So unfortunately, SOLIDWORKS doesn't have good tools to link things at the assembly level for somewhat unskilled kids. So if you have like power users and stuff, you can link assemblies really nicely and share dimensions and have global variables and all that. But uh, I've never been able to reconcile that with people running different versions of SOLIDWORKS and kids with low training. It's always gone, gone badly. But you can make almost a whole system one part. And a part is always reflexive to itself. And you make this by making a part with a bunch of bodies. And then you can chop all those bodies into individual parts. So what we used to do is we'd just have the speed round day where we chopped all the individual bodies into parts using configurations and body delete and all that. But SOLIDWORKS has now made a tool to do that for you. So first I'm going to open up an example of like what you can do as a multi-body thing. So... Uh, this is something one of the kids was exploring. We made this first sketch. I don't know, it's not super detailed. You got some wheels, you got the frame, yada, yada. So we extruded that. Oh, where's the bar? All right, so you end up with this, and you end up with two solid bars. Now, what's cool, I don't know if you guys know this, you can come click that sketch again and extrude it again. And the reason it's done as two separate options is to make sure that these other rails end up as a separate body. Um, and what bodies are in SOLIDWORKS is just, they're just physical solids that are not joined. And what you got to be careful of there is adjacent features. If this box here is checked, merge result, will join, excuse me, into one body. So you want to make sure through this kind of scary process, you don't merge result to keep everything separate. Uh, the next thing we did to keep the mass proper, oh, no, we added these other tubes. You know, there's probably some sketch for that. Added that. Uh, we're starting to, you can see we're cutting the tubes into tubes now to make them, you know, valid weight-wise. Oh, now we cut those other tubes. Uh, we added some verticals. There's some thing we're exploring. Just for trivia bonus points, anyone know what we might be doing here? It's okay if you don't. What was that? I know what you're trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, it's like what 118 did in 2014. All right, not really sure what else we're adding here, but I'll come all the way down to the bottom now. So now you have this frame that, like, I mean, count this up, guys. You would have had to make and name, I don't know, 12 parts, have the correct lengths. You would have used a bunch of mates to put them together. Like, I, I don't know how long it took uh, us to draw this, but I would guess this is probably like three or four minutes. You know, what, what do you think that guys would take you if you were doing that as an assembly, just to make it the first time? Half hour, that seems reasonable. Might be longer if you're first starting. So the um, downside is that you don't have separate parts to make the drawing. We don't yet. But we don't yet, but, but we're marching there. Um, so the upside is you get much closer to, especially if this was a better example, and I'll go back to that elevator in a moment. Um, you have one sketch that is not just controlling a part. You have a sketch that's like controlling a whole system almost. And you can go real far with this. You can come in and you know, draw your bearing blocks. You can put your shafts in here. You can do all the stuff in here. And I, I still feel like it's wrong. Maybe I shouldn't be teaching everyone this. But it's worked out super, super valuable for us because it's super fast. It's super reflexive. And now that there's this magic bullet, there's really low cost to splitting it into different parts. So uh, when you're all done, let's pretend there's like 50 more parts in here. Um, you know, we generally do the gearbox separate because it's bigger, but you might have bearing blocks and shafts and that kind of stuff. You're going to go insert features, save bodies. So I'm not going to fully go over this tool because it takes a little bit of time to do, but there's good YouTube videos on this. What version did they add that? They added this for 2016. So what this tool is doing is it identified every body here. Um, and, the, and this is the, the new student edition, by the way. So whoever, like, this summer got the new student edition, you will have this for next season. If you're still running on what you had last season, it won't work. 
um, you can click and you can start naming these. You know, like, oh, this is the, did it not click? I want this to be the upper cross, yada, yada. And you can march all the way down and name every single one of these. And then when you're done and hit save, um, and I'm not going to do this now just to save time, because it does take a little moment, especially when you add a lot of parts. But you name all of them, hit save, it makes all the files, and it makes an assembly with valid mates. And then you can come, and it shows up as a feature in the bottom of your initial part. And I'll show you guys that in a moment. And then you can make changes on it still, and it works in the assembly. And now you have uniquely named parts that are individual parts that essentially are all linked back to mostly one sketch. So when we go back to that simple cascade, the, oh, you know what? I didn't actually save it. I'm sorry. I thought I had done it on this. That's embarrassing. Well, you guys will have to trust me. It's a really awesome tool. You march through that, you name all the stuff, and you end up with this assembly. It's totally valid. Um, it's got all your stuff. So What's the tool called? Uh, you go to Insert, Features, and then Save Bodies. And what's also cool, a real cool thing, is uh, it notices what bodies you have in there that are identical. And it doesn't make that part twice. It knows that it's the same part. So when you go to that assembly, it catches that you have, you know, six little frame support guys. It goes, oh, no, that's quantity six of the same part. Yes. Yes, you, you can. I mean, I would argue you, you shouldn't, but you absolutely can. It just it, it goes in the order of everything happens. So the way the feature tree works, it goes through the whole feature tree of the part, that was the, you know, like the super assembly part. It does the split to everything. And then in terms of like reflexiveness, it now starts with features that are on the individual part. What's up over here? Uh, you said that it will assemble it with the appropriate ma mates. And so like, for example, that elevator, will it have mates so that it won't be able to move freely or will it have? Yeah, so actually that is kind of a bummer. When I said appropriate, what I mean is it does exactly what it was in the assembly. So for something like that, you know, you get it completely done. I mean, luckily they're all fixed mates. Yeah. So then you can clean up a little bit. It's still a lot faster than doing it manually, though. Um, also, I think what our team would actually do in that situation, it's kind of hokey, is you know, we would split to the assembly, and then we would make that assembly like four configurations. One configuration is like the frame. One configuration is the second stage. One configuration is that claw stage. And then you just mate those together with like three mates, and you should keep all the reflexiveness you had before. So which is cool. You can edit the like, super part you started with, yeah. and it populates through everything. Yes. Um, it does seem a little buggy if you add parts to the, if you add bodies to the initial part, you do have to rerun the tool, and it works like 99% of the time in terms of placing that body in the assembly. Sometimes it doesn't. I've, I've seen it happen a couple of times. And then all you do is, it still generates the part, but you got to grab that part and just put it in the assembly like you would usually. And it's like, oh, that's, that's a bummer, but it still worked well. Maybe. Think um, about it. I, I don't know, but it's, it's been a I'm definitely not the one to answer that question. Okay. But uh, that doesn't mean you're wrong. What's up back here? Uh, I, you know, I have not looked because it doesn't show up as is any consequence to us. I would assume the origins show up, whatever their relation was to that body, to the I'm trying to like dance around right now and see you to the origin in the super part kind of. So like the origin of this part up here is probably down here where the origin of the elevator is. Um, but that, that shouldn't matter. And, and really the power in this, guys, I think, is you, know, you probably don't want to go so far that you do like your wheels and your shafts and that sort of thing. But uh, it's really good for frames. You know, because frames really arguably are one part. And like if you guys do weldments, you, know, you kind of should be using the weldment tool, which is a 3D sketch that kind of does a similar thing here. It doesn't have as many features. Uh, it doesn't have the full features apart. So I, I prefer this way. Also, we don't do weldment, so I, I prefer this way. Um, forgot where I was going with that. But yeah, this is really good for frames. I wouldn't necessarily go so far to build all your shafts in if you're first trying it out, because it, it puts that much more like technical debt into the one part if anything goes wrong. So that's all my material. So we got 15 minutes for, for any topics, Q&A. We can talk more about this. I can open up a couple different things. Uh, what do you guys think? Yes, sir? So I have a question. Um, question, question that 
you have a team of six or eight guys working on the mm-hmm. How do you organize that so they're not working on each other? You know, somebody changing something that shouldn't be changed. That's a really good question. So we used to use SVN for version control. Um, that was something a couple of California teams are using. We've now moved over to GrabCAD, which is, I really love GrabCAD. Uh, it's kind of an in-between of like the ease of use and the embeddedness of Dropbox, but it has version control, it has account names, an admin can come in and go, oh no, you know, Billy's changes are wrong, we want to pull those out. It has the conflict management and that sort of thing. Yeah. So there's that. I think that always needs to be supplemented with, uh, you know, if, if you have people out of computer designing, in my opinion, there's no reason they can't be in some sort of group chat or like a Google Doc where they're writing like, hey, I'm in this right now. So Because that, that saves a lot of conflict. If someone's in there and goes, hey, I'm in Drive right now, that helps a lot versus like, you know, relying purely on version control to handle the problem of two people sharing the same thing. We use GrabCAD. It's free for everybody, I believe now. It used to be free just for FRC teams and some other people. Um, but yeah, I think communication is important. Um, proper use of sub-assemblies can be really important because really powerful tools, you know, you have five, six people working or whatever. Someone's working in the shooter, someone's working in the drive frame, someone's working in this, and no one's actually working in the top-level robot assembly. The top-level robot assembly should only have sub-assemblies in my mind. You know, depending on how complicated your robot is, maybe like five to 20 or something. 20 if you're 118, five if you're like fairly basic robot. And what's nice about that is at different intervals you guys can intelligently use GrabCAD. You know, you save and you go, oh, I just want to check in my drive assembly and all the parts. And he's just going to check in the shooter stuff. And she's just going to check in the intake. And then you guys can all update whenever you want. And since you're all not working in the top level assembly, you can have the top level assembly open, just not save anything. And you can see all their changes in real time as, as you're doing polls at least, so real time. Um, and see, oh, you know, she moved the intake over, that's not going to work for this, we need to talk about that, that sort of thing. So um, we actually use that a lot when we're working in person. It seems kind of weird to use, you know, internet-based version control to make working in person a lot easier, but it's great because you can talk, hey, you know, I'm like three minutes out, and then I'm going to commit, how are you at? Okay, you're at a good stopping point too, we'll both commit, we'll update, oh, we see each other's changes. Does that answer your question? Cool. So I'm, I build an intake, I build a shooter, intake brings in my game piece gets stuck between my intake and my shooter. Any advice on how to make Say that again? Your what? My game piece gets stuck between my intake, intake and my shooter because uh, my interaction between those two things is not quite right. Any, kind of, I don't know how to make that happen except for you try it and you fiddle with it and then you put in some duct tape and I don't know. Um, I mean, a lot of that comes back to, I think as many of those problems as possible are in that 2D sketch. You know, even if, you know, if it's a huge robot, you know, intake, shooter, all this stuff, potentially you have a 2D sketch that isn't linked to any parts, and it's just, the, you know, the ball path of the robot. But I would argue most FRC robots can be broken down into a handful of 2D sketches to show the really high-level interferences. Sure, you're going to run into, like, oh, you know, in that sketch, I didn't fully represent the Matic cylinder and the clevis rubs, and you're going to have to do the reasonable thing in the moment to solve those problems. But uh, I definitely think... You want to put as much effort as possible to catching the, like the high level, like, oh, this was never not going to hit at the 2D level versus 3D. But the phrase 2D sketch for the ball path is my takeaway, actually. That yes, is. yes. Mm-hmm. And, and it would be great to see a bunch of examples of those, actually. Um, Maybe not this instance, but I'm just saying in general. I know I have them. I don't know if I can find them quickly. Especially since I'm, I'm, what I'm thinking of, I'm pulling up someone else's work. Any other questions while I'm looking for this? Is there a way to edit what tools you have at the top? Yeah, uh, and I recommend you just Google it. There's, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I get stuck every once in a while when that thing's happened, and then I'm like, oh, I haven't done this for two years. Google it, and you can see what's there. I map almost everything to keyboard shortcuts, and then I also do, I think this is actually maybe one of the best takeaways of the day. Get a mouse where you can map enter, escape, and then whatever other keys you want on there. Like, the accumulation of two seconds at a time you save by having that is a huge amount. And then it's also, you'll find, useful for other programs. So, like, this whole shooter there is one part, and I'm hoping it has a really good first sketch. I didn't draw it though, so if it doesn't, it's not my fault. Uh, oh, it kind of does, it just didn't, ha- oh, you know what, that's funny, because when we started season, this was our shooter, because we were a very short robot, and that was our whole 
shooter thing. Kind of had a 1678 thing where the ball has like a half inch to move before you shoot it. But yeah, you can see this is, you got to zoom in because it's kind of confusing. Um, you got the motor mounts, you got timing belts, you have all the holes, you have sensor mount holes, you have where the flywheels are, you have all this frame, and then that marks towards. Da, 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 da. At some point, oh, I can't cover with my hand on here. Originally it was this, and then we're like, oh man, we really should go tall, and then we drew all this in. So there probably isn't a good sketch for the conveyor path, but uh, we did retrofit that in. So that was, an, that was a sort of okay example. We went tall like we cat five and a half. What was that? Yeah. Well, and I mean, arguably there was the shooter ball path and that sort of thing. It just wasn't a very long traversal. Any other stuff for you guys? We got ten minutes. The, the resource things that you started with at the very, very, very beginning, are those on your team's website? I, no, our website is not great. Um, I know all of these presentations are getting posted, though, but Solid Professor dot com slash frc is i don't know they've been doing that for a year or two uh the symbotic solder series are both on their website i link their website just because it's easier words um but it's also a, a playlist on their youtube channel and then uh my youtube channel is youtube.com slash 970 ramp you don't actually have to do the user it just shows up that way when you copy it um yeah i think the, if, if you if a student you know is stoked to do cad and goes through these three tools like that puts you in a pretty good spot to, to make things work. You're, you're, they're going to be missing some advanced stuff, but you'll be able to draw robots and you know, work with other people and CAD for them and that sort of thing. Got nine minutes. I got good answers. I just don't know what questions to do. Yes, sir? Um, it's kind of been all over the place. Sometimes it's, it's one person. Sometimes it's four or five. You know, it really depends on the talent involved. I think the key takeaway, and this isn't quite the question you asked, but it might be, is, is how do you split up the design? Because uh, in my mind, CAD is really not the conceptual design at all. You know, the kid CADing in the corner should not have exclusive domain of this is what the robot's going to do. They're just implementing what some larger group has talked about and agreed in. And ideally, there's a really healthy communication process between the design kid who might be in this other group and the conceptual design group. And you know, there has to be trust both ways. You might hit a certain point where the person doing design is like, I can't make that work. Like, I, I'm out of ideas. I can't make it work. And the other way is, you know, they might disagree with what the conceptual design people are asking, but they need to put their, their full faith in honestly trying to implement it. You know, you can't, like, oh, I don't really like this idea, so I'm not going to try as hard, and then I'm going to say it doesn't work. Because um, a lot of teams, you know, they, they have a lot of people designing, so they're all in CAD, and it'd actually be a lot better if instead of you had eight people in CAD, you really had two or three, but, the, you know, the other ones are really influential in the design, they're doing a lot of prototyping, there's a lot of review, there's a lot of discussion, because it's really a lot easier to just, you know, power a user through SolidWorks and cut down the number of communication paths. Because if you have two three people CADing, but it's either one communication path or three, you go to eight, and now there's so many opportunities for you to change something to mess his stuff up, and she changes something to messes that up, and that sort of thing. So, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. So, five minutes or less, describe different levels of skill and how, what, what are the optimal ways to reach them? Whew, God, okay. So I learned Inventor in like 2001, and I don't remember what it was like at all, other than it seemed really hard and now everything like seems trivial. So I, I don't have a good answer there. Um, I have seen students put you know, like 20, 40 hours into it, and it seems like they're still spinning their wheels and can't quite get stuff. And I've seen students go through the tutorials, talk to me for two hours, and like they're drawing arms and stuff, and they're able to make it happen. So I don't know. Let's, when you find out, let me know, though. I'd love to know. Yeah. I mean, it's also tough in an environment when it's not like a classroom setting. You're not teaching everyone the same thing at the same time. It's kind of more nebulous. And well, I, I, I've definitely had kids all over the place in terms of time it takes to, to get skilled. And then also there's kind of a separate variable. Sometimes you have kids who are really, really good, but as soon as it's seasoned and it's the real thing, they can't make the decisions. 
So the, all the technical skill is there, but once it's the real deal, you know, it's like they did, like, I mean, I, I always have the kids that are, you know, learning CAD, you know, do drivetrains in the fall, do an arm, elevator, I just keep giving them something else to do than review, and you just, we just march their skills up that way. They're like, well, I'd like to do a shooter next, and it's like, great, let's do that, I'll review it, and, you know, we'll keep doing that, and then we get to season, and it's like, they just, they just can't make a decision because, you know, you have the whole pressure of, you know, that we got to be good, and we got to do stuff, and it's like, no, you, you're making good decisions. Two months ago, you, you're, you're capable of making good decisions. Now, this is all in your head. Okay, that's, that's, that's really cool. Five more minutes. What do you guys think? Aaron, want to give me a softball? Is there anything really obvious I missed? Are there, are there like low-level stuff you guys are still wondering about? Uh, default headers for gear spacing, depending on multi-stage. That's a good one. So. Uh, <laughs> We just add 3,000 to all of our 20 DP center to center distances. So if you're getting to the point where you're designing gearboxes, we add 3,000 to the center to center. That's right. That's wrong. Teams do everything in between. Bigger deal is grease your gears. I don't know. It seems, I don't know what it is recently, but it's like each additional year we see more and more teams that are like, all the teeth are gone. I don't know what happened. And there was just never grease on it. Maybe it's because we have more aluminum gears and it's harder to get away with on aluminum, but. More important to grease your gears than to nail the center to center. Uh, chain spacing adder? Uh, chain spacing, I don't know the right answer off the top of my head. We did 50,000 this year on like an 8-inch run, and that worked. It was a little difficult to install. Uh, I'd like to run in chain on something off the robot first, because like half the train stretch is, well, it's actually all wear. It's not stretch. It's, it's very initial, so if you could like get that wear out and then make it easier to install, that's, that'd be nice. Well, that's just the lube what was that? Interesting. I haven't heard that. It makes sense, though. When you do the math, like a tenth, like like a tenth of a thou uh, per chain link adds up to actually appreciable distances on a standard FRC chain. Timing belt versus chain box. Timing belt is certainly better in some applications, and we were super gung ho on it for a couple of years, and I'm now kind of come back to chain for almost everything, just from a supply chain issue, like. Um, you know, I'm kind of getting nice. I'm trying to get nine seven three to the point where it's like, okay, we decide we want to do X, and then we can just do it tomorrow. And that's harder with timing belt. But there are a couple places where it's really nice. Uh, we like uh, West Coast Products has a timing belt line for the seven seven five Pros and the bag motors and the five fifties. That's really nice for like shooters. If you guys want to look, West Coast Products. I don't know their website. I think it's wcproducts.net, maybe dot com. Um, RC, the owner, is here. If you look at the shooter on our competition robot, not the like square, funky looking turret one, there's a 775 Pro with a time belt reduction right to the shooter. It's really nice because you don't need any gearbox. It handles misalignment fairly well. It's very quiet. Uh, I like doing it there. For like drive power transmission, it just the risk reward doesn't seem there for me. I mean, there's a couple really good teams to do it and they're totally right, but there, there's some science behind doing it for drive safely. All right. I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks for your time, guys. Thanks for coming.